Now on with the, the presentation. Our presenters today are both from the Irvine-based Edwards Life Sciences, the global leader in the science of heart, valves, and hemodemic monitoring. Adam Porter is the Senior Director of Human Resources for the Critical Care Division and is also an advisory board member of the UCI's HR certification program. Adam has more than 15 years of human resource experience in organization effectiveness, change management, employee relations, staffing, and training. Tori Brent is the Manager of University Relations and Branding. She has more than 13 years of human resource experience. She is, primarily, she is a primary liaison between universities and Edwards Life Sciences in the pursuit of hiring the best university talent. With that, I will turn the presentation over to Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, as we get started here today, both Tori and I would like to extend our appreciation to HireRight. UCI Extension and our audience for the opportunity to be a part of this webinar. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, so let's jump right in. Today we want to speak to how we view the definition of onboarding, why it's important for organizations to invest in the onboarding process. We'll talk a little bit about some of the key components and share a few of the best practices that we have researched. And then also how we've developed the onboarding process at Edwards Life Sciences. So right now, the candidates have been interviewed. Uh, they've passed the background check. They've accepted the offer. We have a start date. So let's talk about some of the next steps and by defining uh, onboarding. In reviewing the literature, there are a number of different definitions on what onboarding is and what it's not. Uh, we've chosen a few that we feel highlight key points that we believe are important. It's about ensuring people know what is expected and how they add value. Uh, this is key, as we'll discuss during the next session, because shorting the loss of productivity is a key business driver. If people don't know what's expected of them and how it adds value to the organization, it definitely makes it difficult to achieve the required results that the organization has to achieve. And in theory, this is definitely a simple concept, but in time, I guess as we take a look at it, when everyone is asked to do more, it's key to understand not only what is expected, but how it should be prioritized and how it fits into the organization's mission or value proposition. Second, it's more than orientation. Many of our organizations do a great job at orientation, which may range from a few hours to a few days, depending on the organization, and covering things like new hire paperwork, benefits, et cetera. The key distinction that we will like to draw here is that the onboarding process is part of an overall talent strategy and it begins during the hiring process and continues until the individual is fully productive and integrated into the organization versus ending after new hire orientation. And even though it may be well planned, it's not a one size fits all program. It can be tailored by level. For example, the onboarding process for a CFO may have many of the same base components, but will look different in terms of breadth and depth than the onboarding for a financial analyst. Last, we often think of onboarding as a process that applies to newly hired employees. The research tells us that it's equally applicable to internal employees who are promoted or transferred into new roles or assignments. So one of the things that I'd like to kind of bring a light here within Edwards, we you know, categorize people into top talent segments and uh, we've been developing stretch assignments for high potential for a number of, the years, a number of years. And during that time, we found that we were having a higher uh, than desired fallout rate in terms of our uh, high potentials, not necessarily leaving the company, but uh, changing their talent designation. And so when we started looking into this, we found out that we weren't really doing a great job or as good of a job as we could be in terms of uh, orienting, orienting them to their new assignment. And so we put in place assimilation processes, coaching processes, and we began to see that decrease uh, a decrease in the number of people that were falling out of those talent categories. So I think the point here is making sure that we're looking at it both from an internal as well as an external uh, process. So as we discussed briefly during the first slide, with the pace of competition today, uh, time is truly money. And having the ability to shorten the amount of time it takes to get people up to speed can be of incredible value. 
so other examples that we use, we have, have uh, over the past couple of years, we've had some key product launches and have had to hire a number of new people into the organization. And so one of the things that we've done from a, a onboarding process was to take a look at these particular situations that we identified as part of our workforce planning process and clearly uh, started to understand what are the tr what's the tribal knowledge that exists within the organization in terms of making sure that these people are getting up to speed. So we went out and interviewed knowledge holders, uh, capturing that tacit knowledge, uh, accessing the expertise of the organization in terms of who's the best person to deliver the training. It's not always the manager. Uh, identified some of the gaps and gained an alignment on what that process was going to look at through the, those reviews. So during the onboarding process, then people didn't hear just from the manager. They heard from the best people in the, in the resources that need, they needed to hear from within the organization in order to be trained on this particular activities. And then we worked that into a matrix uh, that provided a roadmap on what learning was needed and what the best resources were. Now, I know a number of people on the call may be from large organizations where you have a global, uh, uh, global environment and you're doing business in a number of different markets, and I think this is another area where onboarding becomes quite important. Uh, an example would be in, in China or some of the Asia markets where turnover rates can be as high as 25% on a regular basis. Having a sound onboarding process so that you know, when you do experience that turnover in place, uh, in place when that ex uh, turnover is uh, experienced is key. So to sum up, in our opinion, you know, onboarding is a strategic process that's part of an overall talent strategy for newly hired or internal employees that enables them to quickly contribute to a desired level by ensuring they understand expectations, how they add value, and also that they are able to develop the organizational relationships they need for success. So, so far we've talked about defining onboarding. Let's turn and take a look at some of the numbers and what organizations gain or lose by not having effective onboarding practices in place. There are numerous studies and programs that calculate the cost of turnover. Uh, these costs include not only termination processing, recruiting, and orientation time, but lost productivity for the new hire, as well as lost productivity for the individuals that are taking time to train them, uh, up to lost revenue, especially in the case of sales or customer-facing positions. Uh, at the end of the seminar, we provided a tool, a resource that I've used in the past to calculate and track these costs on a monthly basis. And we've used it as a tool to report to management on the cost and help justify preventive programs like onboarding and engagement to minimize that turnover. The bottom line is unwanted turnover costs money, and effective onboarding programs can help reduce unwanted turnover of new hires and improve the success rates of internal promotions and new assignments. A study by the Aberdeen Group found that organizations with a standard onboarding process experienced 54% greater new hire productivity, 50% greater new hire retention, and two times the level of new hire engagement. I think this really provides organizations with a triple win when productivity levels increase, the turnover costs are reduced in engagement levels, which reflect the level of discretionary effort people bring to their role increases. So a few additional statistics uh, from research done by the Corporate Leadership Council, and I'll go from the bottom left to right. Um, and so these are uh, based on new hire performance scores that were indexed on a scale for 100 points. So when the managers are highly confident that they've made the right hiring decision, they saw an increased level of new hire performance. When the, the new hire were confident that they made the right decision, you saw an even greater increase in the level of performance with the new hire's intent to stay. And then finally, at the top right, when you looked at this, new hires were confident that we made the, they made the right decision. You also saw a difference in terms of their level of engagement, again, going back to that discretionary effort that is required that all companies are looking for in terms of driving a high-performance culture. So our takeaway on this is that the better job we do of hiring and onboarding the right talent and then the focusing on the right talent, the more valuable they become to the organization and the more productive they are. So to close out this section, uh, in the book, The First 90 Days, 
by uh, Michael Watkins. He discusses what he calls the break-even point. And the break-even point is being the point at which new leaders contribute as much value to the, their organization as they consume from it. So he went out and surveyed 210 CEOs and presidents. And on average, they placed the break-even point at 6.2 months. Now, that may be, a, depending on the level of position, that may be a little bit longer, and certainly, you know, depending on uh, uh, lower levels in the organization, individual contributors, it may be shorter. But in general, they, this averaged out to be 6.2 months. The, the, the goal of onboarding, or as he calls it, transition acceleration, is to really help new leaders reach that break-even point earlier. And the whole idea around this, again, is going back to making sure that they're up to speed as quickly as possible, and that they're contributing productively. So the question is, how do we do this better, and then what value does it add to the organization? So let's talk a little bit about some of the key components of onboarding. We've divided them into three areas. Pre-boarding, which are those activities that take place prior to the first day on the job. Orientation, those traditional activities associated with a new hire's first day or week on the job. And then integration and assimilation, uh, activities that are associated with learning the job, the people, the culture, and other areas that help quickly help them increase their ability to, to uh, deliver productivity. So what I thought we'd do in this uh, next session is provide a few examples of each before going on to review some of the three best practices that we selected. So pre-boarding. Uh, obviously, most organizations follow up and send out an offer letter, but one of the things that we found from a pre-boarding aspect that helps engage employees is to send a welcome letter and maybe some type of gift. Uh, so the welcome letter could do a number of different things. It could provide uh, them with company articles or reading materials. And in the case of our organization, we've sent videos, uh, patient videos, because of the work we do that um, uh, lets people know a little bit more about our organization. Uh, we've included gift baskets in the past, so uh, whether it's a fruit basket or other things like that. And it does a couple different things. One is certainly uh, re-engages the candidate during that period between the offer letter going out and the date they hire, but also tends to engage their family or significant other or other people in their organization. And we found that they've come in and been very willing to share that information with family and friends, and it's, been, it's just really been a great touch. Obviously, as I said, providing uh, things, whether it's the annual report or other re reading materials uh, that people would be interested in that are uh, uh, germane to your company and organization that are important things for them to know about is helpful. Uh, we could as we've assigned peer mentors in some cases, and uh, uh, people may know this as a buddy system, uh, but a number of, another uh, name for it is peer mentors. So someone in your organization that they can reach out and touch to that will help them over their integration period to understand some of the, the culture of the organization, who to talk to, um, how to get things done. The other things that you can do in advance is to schedule key meetings, uh, especially across the organization. So there may be people within the de de department that they're joining or across uh, other functions uh, that they might need to meet over the next, over the first 30 to 60 to 90 days. So getting those meetings on calendar in advance is, is uh, you know, another basic idea I think that has worked out well. And then the last two items, uh, you know, are kind of basics uh, for most of us, but I think we've found even in our organization sometimes if a manager's not focusing on this, if it's not planned, and sometimes a new hire can show up on the first day, and maybe their computer hasn't been ordered. So making sure that there's office space, supplies, equipment, those things uh, would seem fairly basic, but sometimes it can get lost if there's not a pre-planned process in, in, in place. And then last, other administrative forms that can be sent out uh, to the individual in advance, whether it's I-9 forms or other benefit forms and things like that that you might want to have completed. So in terms of orientation, as we said, most employers have some type of formal orientation program. I think the key here is to provide context for the new employee. 
At this stage, there may be questions in her or his mind about did they make the right decision? What is this organization about and will they fit in? So day one activities focused on building initial relationships and helping people becoming self-efficient. So the introductions obviously to uh, people in the department, maybe there's uh, making sure that there's an employee announcement that goes out if that's uh, something that's appropriate for the role and the level. Uh, and a lot of times we have new hires get involved in that. We send them a draft and have them participate so that they uh, have input to that announcement. And obviously some of the human resources forms and administration that needs, need to be done. In terms of orientation, what we do here in our Irvine, Irvine location is that we have a monthly orientation program for both our uh, professional and then our hourly work, workforce. And in those presentations, we go through the company history. We talk about our strategy. Uh, we talk about our key markets that we're a part of and then some of our products. Uh, we certainly go through things that are important to our culture in terms of ethics, values, and aspirations. Uh, we talk about our industry and then give an overview of our competition. Uh, we do leader, uh, introductions to our leadership team and then we actually have some of our executives that come into each of these uh, orientation sessions and present as well as managers from throughout the organization. And we go through that leadership team structure and then again some of the things that are important to our culture and obviously the administrative processes. So really again this is about setting the context for um, the employee kind of kind of big picture and then being, being able in the next steps to go down into kind of what it means uh, to them on a, a more personal basis. And the one thing I didn't mention here that is as just as a quick aside that seems to always come up at least in our organization, I think um, many companies have a list of acronyms that they use. And I think, you know, as I talk to new hires, you know, one of the things that is frustrating for them is that they go into meetings and somebody's throwing around a whole bunch of different ac acronyms and they don't really know what's going on. So those are other little things I think that we should take into consideration and make sure that we provide those types of things as well. So let's talk a little bit about integration and assimilation. Uh, I've divided them into three areas. So, uh, you know, we've all heard in terms of human resources that the manager is the most important person in an employee's relationship in terms of uh, their intent to stay or causing turnover. And I think it gets to be the same thing with on onboarding. The manager is an import, has an important role to play in that. And so that's why we've listed it first in terms of manager one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, being able to sit down with the employee and go through what that assimilation plan looks like, uh, making sure that there's time committed to go over what the expectations are, uh, what are the goals for that department or that particular individual, and then what milestones are in place. Uh, obviously, sitting down and understanding what formal on-the-job training needs to take place, and then setting up periodic uh, times during the first 30 to 90 days to check in and provide focused feedback uh, on what things are going well, what challenges are the, is the person experiencing, if any, and being able to close that feedback loop and make sure that, um, you know, that we are all tracking to the same goals and objectives. The peer mentor I spoke a little bit about earlier. I think this uh, is a very key and helpful. I know we've used it in human resources. I know we've used it in a couple of other organizations across uh, uh, Edwards Life Sciences, but it's just having that go-to person aside from the manager that really helps them maybe get involved more with the informal culture of the organization. Uh, who are the people to go to? What are the processes that need to take place? And it takes a little bit of the workload, again, off the manager says they're not the only ones that need to go in and take, take a look and, and be part of their transition into the organization. So there are a number of ways to leverage the peer mentor. And we have certainly maybe during the Q&A uh, section, if there's additional questions about that, we can go into that. And then communications. Uh, uh, we have, an, depending on the size of your organization, uh, you know, with Edwards we have a number of different divisions. So we, uh, each of our business division leaders usually has monthly or quarterly uh, meetings. So making sure that that uh, business leader in our particular case uh, our leader within critical care has a quarterly meeting where he invites all new hires to where they come uh, to a meeting, get to know him personally, a little bit of his background, talk, talk about our specific goals within the critical care division and what their role is in it. And it's a, really a great forum uh, and it's a very informal meeting that takes about an hour on a quarter basis. 
and then meeting with, with key stakeholders across the organization. Uh, again, can't underrate that in terms of be, getting involved into the culture. Uh, again, depending on the level of the organization, the person is in the organization, there may be more or less meetings depending on who they need to meet with. In our organization, it goes across research and development to quality, to finance, to manufacturing. And so uh, making sure that you've identified who those key stakeholders are that they'll be working with on a regular basis and uh, establishing those relationships I think are very important. So now I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about integration and assimilation for leaders, uh, a little bit different than individual contributors. And as we know, the leaders have you know, a broader impact on the organization, I'm not saying it's more or it's less, but normally they're responsible for a group of people versus obviously you know, uh, their own individual work. And so I've kind of broken this up into two areas that I think it's um, key in terms of managing the business. We talked about a little bit about this. You know, it's about you know, understanding the organization's ethics, values, aspiration, history. Uh, we have, uh, as many organizations, do uh, a, what we call our Edwards Life Sciences Leadership Program, which is available to directors and above. And we hold that three to four times a year. And we bring people from across the globe uh, at the director and above level to participate in that, and it's a week-long orientation into our culture and what it means in, in the business. Uh, so I think those are important keys to be, kind of take a look at. In terms of um, managing administration, there are those things that you know, you know, that just have to be done in order to uh, survive and get to know the organization on a day-to-day -day basis. So whether it's email, phone systems, expense processes, purchasing, travel. Those are all the kind of the basic kind of fundamentals that you know, people need to understand. So how do you navigate those types of things in the organization? And then managing people. What's your organization's talent philosophy? What's, uh, if you have competencies and traits, what are those? What's your compensation cycle? What's your philosophy around compensation? Um, what things do they need to know around employment law, performance management systems? the merit process, talent acquisition, et cetera. So how do we kind of pull those things into a bucket and help people understand that, again, over that first 30 to 60 to 90 day pro process? So some of the things that we've uh, looked at and done for assimilating new leaders is leader coaching. Uh, again, depending on the level, you know, the, and you'll see in one of the uh, best case practices examples that we'll share with you in a few minutes. I think it's from American Express. Uh, they have a leader coaching program that they do with their executives when they come in and they assign uh, a leader uh, a coach to those leaders. We also uh, do uh, what we call new leader assimilation, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. And then again, as I've mentioned earlier before, making sure that they, the new leaders understand who the key stakeholders are and what are the in, uh, networks that they are involved in the organization. So talking about leader assimilation, this is a process uh, uh, I can't say that we've invented. I, I honestly can't remember you know, uh, where it came from. It was here when, and when I joined, but we've taken uh, an approach to do this now within our critical care business unit with uh, new leaders as they come into the organization, usually around the 90-day period. And what it is is a process that we go through and we ask these four questions during the process. What does the group know about the leader? what would the group like to know about the leader, the concerns that they might have for the leader in the organization, and then what should the leader know about members of the group. This is a process that's facilitated by our human resources business partner team. And the way it works is that we'll uh, normally, when a person gets hired, we'll meet with the leader in advance. We'll let them know about this process and that we'll do it at 90 days. We walk them through what the process is, which is we meet with them. They come to the meeting along with their direct reports on their team. And they participate and kick off and kick off the meeting with us, and let the team know, you know, that it's important and how they support this. And then the leader leaves the room, and we flip chart, you know, these questions with the group. And it's surprising some of the things that come out uh, of these the things that people think they know or or that they'd like to know about the leader. Um, and we found it is a very good process to gather f in, uh, feedback and input at, during that 60 to 90 day period after someone has just come on board. Once the team finishes that, then the team leaves and takes a break, and the leader comes back in, and then we debrief with that leader the questions and the themes that came up. We don't share individual names. 
uh, but just basically go to the, through the themes, and then that leader uh, then is able to pick out which questions he or she would like to ask and address with the group. Everybody comes back comes back together. We go through that, and usually there's two to three or four action items coming out of that. Maybe it's you know having more time with individuals. Maybe it's them getting to know more about that leader's particular career aspirations or uh, communication styles within the group, and then we've just found that to be a very effective process. So now what I'd like to do is go in and uh, speak a little bit to some of uh, some best practices that uh, we found when we were out researching uh, this topic of onboarding and what the, what that looks like. And this first one uh, kind of hits on some of the things that we've talked about already. Um, and this is, again, information from the Corporate Leadership Council. Um, so, you know, sending the updated offer letter, you know, I've, I've made these available in slides as well afterwards. So if you want to, you know, pull these up, you can have them. But sending an updated offer letter, you know, doing things uh, from a pre-start report, you know, sending out the orientation schedule, details, uh, welcome, maybe a welcome a card from that's signed by the members of the team, uh, conducting the business unit or the company orientation, setting up the peer mentor program, peer mentor program and then uh, scheduling the one-on-one -on -one sessions with the manager. This next example, and again, I apologize for the, um, the small font here, but it will be available to you. But I thought this was, you know, I, I selected these three from the standpoint of, you know, kind of there's a broad overview. Here's something that's more customer service orientated uh, or focused. And some of the things are the same, but I'd kind of uh, point your attention to delivering new hire training. And I think the takeaway here is, again, depending on the size of your organization and what resources you have, you know, you can look at different methods to deliver that new hire training. It could be classroom-based. Um, uh, learning that you have, you have could do it by e-learning in this particular case, and then on the on the job. So taking a look at different ways to uh, accomplish the onboarding uh, by looking at blended methods. The other things uh, that I would point to is on the right hand side under the key lessons learned when in this particular case is making sure that you're linking it again to the recruitment. Uh, you know, as it states here, the profile companies indicate that it is part of their recruitment process. And I think Tori will speak a little bit more to that as we get into our process in a few minutes. And then the structure and the focus on training, whether it's shadowing or whatever the things that um, you might view as important to take place. This next example is from uh, Daimler Chrysler. Again, uh, you know, I'm not sure in terms of the different sides of organizations that are on the call today. Uh, so depending, you know, on the size of your organization, this may or may not be applicable. But I tried, thought I'd try to give both the bookends, if you will, here, in terms of, you know, the, what's kind of kind of some of the baseline things you would do, and then if you do have a larger organization with other resources, what are some of the ideas that you might be able to tap into? So uh, in Daimler Chrysler's uh, particular situation, they were really looking to foster connection with the new organization's vision and strategy. They wanted to facilitate integration into employee networks. They wanted to make sure that performance expectations were clearly explained early, and they wanted to promote a culture of innovation and open communication. So they rolled out uh, what they called their Navigate program, and it was a six-month onboard onboarding program. And basically, it's, uh, on the left side, you can see it was uh, combined of uh, four areas. So they did DVDs, uh, of course, the manager first day welcome. They had a binder and letter from the CEO outlining their vision. Uh, they did things uh, like doing a welcome day sca scavenger hunt, uh, cruising the company. They used peer mentors. Um, in box three, they uh, integrated it with their performance online performance system to make sure that there were meetings and discussions about performance expectations early. And then at the end of the day in four, they actually had a formal graduation. And so at the box on the right-hand side of the screen, the who, what, and when, again, these are, are will be available to you afterwards. One of the things that stood out for me is uh, in the phase four is that somewhere in the six to nine month time frame, they did a formal graduation at each of their locations. And 
in that uh, thing. They obviously did several celebrations, awarding of certificates. Uh, but there was also a report out from the people from, to their executives on process improvement ideas and findings that they had during their first 90 or 60 to six months in the organization. Now, from an onboarding process, I think that's uh, kind of a new and innovative idea because you kind of think about a lot of times we hire people from the outside the organization and we're expecting to bring in new ideas and they're coming in and looking at things in a with a fresh perspective. So why not tap into that? So we haven't implemented that here, but it's something that uh, gave us food for thought in terms of, you know, do we do something like this with new hires over that first six months and gather ideas on things they might see that might be improved in the organization? Because then you're adding even more value. And I think the last uh, best practice that I wanted to uh, point out is uh, American Express, uh, their new executive career launch. They really looked at uh, three things on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, managing the expectations and the reality gap. I think you know a lot of times new hires come into the organization and they have a little bit of a halo effect. Of course, we're only going to hire the best and the brightest in most of our organizations. So there's that halo effect, I think, that um, occurs quite a bit when people come in, and then there's usually a dip and sometimes because you know uh, no one really walks on water, and there's things that you may see in that first three to six months that you didn't see at the interview process. So how do you effectively manage that and make sure that productivity per curve and that integration happens in a most effective way? And so what they've done is really, in this particular case, um, you know, set up processes to really look at that gap, understand what it is, uh, focus on long-term development early, uh, communicating with that individual, and then, again, making sure that they're building those key relationships for new executives across the organization. On the right side of this screen, it says going beyond the welcome kit, you can see that this kind of goes from pre-employment through a full first year. And some of the components we've talked about already, so I won't, you know, go into those in, in terms of detail, in terms of, you know, kind of meetings with the managers. But if you look uh, down, they, they do, uh, as I said before, kind of get into uh, having a coach early on in the process, making sure that there's uh, an organizational learning plan and coaching agenda within the, uh, uh, within the first 30 days. Uh, at the 30 to 90 day period that there's uh, that individual creates a development plan. And then at the, by the six month time frame, the new hire is meeting with an external coach who has collected 360 degree feedback on them uh, and integrating that into their performance data so that all along the way there are these touch points to make sure that that person gets uh, integrated into the organization and if there are any derailers that are there that, that they are addressed early on. So I'd like to take a little bit, a minute here, and I'm kind of watching our time, so I make sure I don't use all the time and I leave some time for Tori here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about evaluating success. And here's a study that came out in 2008. And what I'd call your attention to is on the left side are a list of different metrics that we've used in human resources, uh, many organizations over the year. But what I've circled on here is onboarding effectiveness. And if you look at this, that had the largest estimate of growth in terms of metrics of any of these um, various components uh, in back in 2008-2009. So I think that speaks to the interest in this area in terms of you know, what uh, organizations are doing to address it and making sure that uh, in this particular labor market as we hire people on, how do we get them onboarded more effectively and up to speed. So some different measures and things we might look at in terms of uh, evaluating success. Certainly, the manager meetings, you know, some of this uh, is a little bit more subjective than objective, but, you know, I think it's just as important, you know, going back to the data that we have from CLC, does the manager feel like they've made the right, right hire? Does the, hire, the person that we've um, hired feel like they've made the right choice? And if there are discrepancies or gaps there, are we, you know, putting things in place to um, adjust those as we go forward. So those manager meetings and feedback sessions, are, I think, are definitely important. Uh, with new hire, new employee orientation evaluations, we certainly do what we call the smile sheets and you know, kind of uh, get feedback from there in terms of how that process went and then incorporate that into ongoing, continuing process improvement. 
Uh, we've, Tori will talk a little bit about this, but we've implemented a new hire employee survey um, that goes out. Uh, is it Tori? Is it at 30 days, 60 days, mm -hmm. What's it, around the that particular time frame? So getting that feedback, and again, this, this is a, a tool that is also available to you after these, um, the session that you can uh, look at. And then the new leader assimilation process we've talked about. And then what we're starting to uh, look at implementing here within the critical care division is doing a quarterly new hire focus group. We have the meetings that happen with the um, business, uh, business leader for our group but then taking maybe quarterly or probably depending on the number of hires, obviously, may go to twice a year, uh, but taking some time with that to give, do focus groups with, that, with them to find out, you know, uh, what are the things they feel are working well and what things we can improve in. And then there's certainly the retention analyses that you can do in terms of are you having turnover at any particular point in time? Are you seeing a lot of fallout in those areas? And then time to 100% productivity, which is, uh, you know, a little bit hard metric to get, but it's more subjective. Is like, you know, the manager, when do you feel someone's really ready and fully engaged in going at 100%? So with that, I'm going to conclude my portion of the presentation and turn it over to Tori Brent, and she's going to speak to us about uh, some of the challenges and opportunities we've had at Edwards and onboarding and what uh, her and her team have done to address those. Thank you, Adam. So basically, the way it was at Edwards was we didn't really have a process. We had lots of information out there, but we didn't have a formal way of getting the information easily accessible to the hiring managers or to the candidates. So the story I'm going to share today is really coming from a recruiting perspective. We were trying to ramp up our field sales force and hire them quickly, get them up to speed quickly, and get in to our customers as soon as possible. So we were faced with time as part of our challenge. And so we were realizing that some of our roles between the recruiters, hiring managers, and the HR business partners were somewhat blurred. So what I mean by that was, you know, you're, you're, the recruiters are establishing the relationship with the candidate. Their goal is to attract and close the offer and then kind of transfer the employee or candidate to the new hire role working with the hiring manager. And at this point, when we're working with the field sales, a lot of the hiring managers were brand new. They were hiring brand new employees on top of that. So there was a lot of confusion going on at the time. And so the recruiter took on kind of like a HR role at this point, trying to help channel communication and information to get the candidate and the new hire up to speed quick, quickly. So obviously this was creating process inefficiencies. This isn't really the recruiter's role. We were realizing we might have put a lot of faith in the managers to onboard employees and kind of assuming that they were doing this, but it turned out that the managers didn't really even know how to onboard employees. So we were finding that you know when, when they were a new hire, they were asking their cube mates or their other coworkers or recruiters and other people how do I get access to a laptop? How do I get access to IT? How do I get VPN? How, where do I find the restrooms? How do I get a badge? When I get to corporate, how, is anyone going to meet me at the front lobby? You know, basic things that the employee really shouldn't be worrying about, but they were the ones that were driving these questions. So it led to making us kind of just hit the pause button saying, you know, what, what's going on here? Why is this so challenging and why is this so frustrating? And it was definitely jeopardizing the new employee experience. And, and it turned into higher stress and higher frustrations on all levels. So we definitely hit the pause button and realized, okay, we, we got to really prioritize this and what's, what's wrong with this picture? And so we kind of did, you know, SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to identify the situation and understand the problems and move quickly through this and wanted to obviously streamline the onboarding process was the goal. We realized we needed to improve the communication channels, ramp up to productivity, and create consistency. And um, so we really wanted to keep the candidate, candidate experience first in mind, and we realized that this was becoming a big, big issue. So, you know, a lot of us were thinking, well, what's the difference between onboarding, pre-boarding, and assimilation? So these kind of questions were definitely coming up, and we realized that the information is out there within Edwards, 
and how to kind of prioritize the information for the manager, setting everybody up for success and move the candidate from the new candidate to the new hire to assimilation was kind of like a staged process. And so we realized that the employees were not getting access to the information, neither were the managers. This was definitely impacting the manager-employee relationship building because, you know, as a new employee, you're going to ask basic questions, and the manager really should be focusing on how to set them up for success, getting them access, and taking out some of that stress. And we really wanted the managers to help accelerate the, the understanding of the culture for the employees as well. Um, to set them up for success so that they can understand the acronyms that Adam was talking about earlier and, and you know, how, to, how to navigate through the communication challenges when you're in a meeting and so forth. So just the inner workings of a culture, right? So obviously we, want to, we wanted to foster employee engagement and retention because we do believe the impact on how someone starts definitely impacts the relationship and their overall impression of the company, whether or not they take the take this seriously or not. And if, if they come on board and, and they're forgotten about in the lobby, for example, what, what kind of impression does that give to the employee? Like, well, they spent all this time and effort to recruit me, to relocate me, but now I'm here. Well, now what? I, I don't want to feel like I've been forgotten about. And so, unfortunately, we were kind of experiencing some of that because we were moving so quickly. And it obviously wasn't the intention of the manager, but we were having some gaps. And so, um, we wanted to... Um, join a partnership with the HR business partners, the talent acquisition team, which are the recruiters, and our organizational effectiveness team, our hiring managers, and administrative staff to identify the critical onboarding elements. And so we wanted to create a navigation roadmap for the employees and for the managers to make it easier for them so that this shouldn't be such a roadblock. We recognized that there were tons of information on our intranet, but it wasn't consolidated. It was not easy to navigate. Even employees that have been here for five years had a difficult time trying to figure out basic information, and that's why it became very tribal knowledge. And so we kind of joke and laugh about it that we've been growing so much and we have so many people that have been here for so long that they've kind of forgotten what it's like to onboard themselves because they already figured it out. And so we have a lot of new employees trying to figure out how to get basic information. So what we did was we started with our field sales and created a pilot. And it literally started off as an email template communication that the admin sent to the managers to help you know, get them prioritizing what needed to be done to pre-board the employee and to onboard them. And now when you're working with field sales, especially in our industry, these sales employees needed to get access to the hospitals quickly. So there were different background requirements to clear them to get access to and enter the hospitals. We needed them to get laptops before they actually started. They needed to get a car. They needed um, a cell phone. And all of this stuff was managed differently for the sales team versus employees that came to corporate. So there were definitely different needs for this particular demographic versus um, how we were used to onboarding employees. So we recognized, okay, we needed to kind of separate or create a different onboarding process for field sales versus our regular employees. And then we realized there were a lot of overlapping information that the field sales needed and our corporate employees. And so the pilot actually grew to what we're calling it an essential beginnings brand of how we onboarded employees. So it started off as a pilot, and then it moved into the a U.S. company intranet for broader employees. And so what I'm going to show you is kind of some screenshots of how we um, categorize this information and try to um, prioritize it for the field sales, field sales individuals as well as what's applicable for a broader um, employee demographic. So we worked with um, a, a recruiting marketing agency who helped design our intranet site to create more of a formal process. And again, you know, we were talking about creating a hub. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. The information was already there. People just didn't know how to access it or where to access it, and they didn't really understand the time, cause, and effect that implement that 
that critically impacted the employees. So it was also educating the managers, okay, it takes two weeks to order a laptop. This is going to be part of the pre-boarding process, right? It takes a couple of weeks to background check them. And, and for us at Edwards, we have a lot of um, uh, spaced issues. So we have a hard time finding cube space or office space. And, and there's a lot of side conversations that need to take place to figure out where a new employee is going to start. And that takes you know, anywhere from two to three weeks, unfortunately, for us, whereas it could be very quick for, for other companies. So managers weren't realizing how long it took to get somebody here before they got here. And so it was educating to them and helping break down these barriers and, and creating these categories and giving them better access and information so that they can better plan and prepare proactively for the uh, new employee to start. So here is a screenshot of our onboarding portal. Um, THV is an acronym for us. It's our transcatheter heart valve sales force. So it looks kind of basic, and this is you know kind of phase one, gen one, however you want to call it. Um, but the key thing here is that you can see it's priority one. And so this was us trying to explain and educate to the managers and to the employees what needed to get done immediately after the offer was extended and we received a, an acceptance. So there were some things that the employee needed to get to us in order for us to get them on board as well. And that was a separate communication to the employees and kind of managing and setting expectations from a time perspective to the new hire as well as to the manager. So we created communication templates and um, kind of explained, okay, here was the pre-boarding process and now this is what is needed to get you on board quickly and faster and as pain-free as possible. So to the next slide, um, this is designed for the employees. You see Essential Beginnings is the new brand. This is now what we use for our um, U.S. employees. And you can see it's saying your next steps for success. So again, we really wanted to create a candidate experience philosophy and an overall experience. So. You know, they start off as a new uh, a candidate coming on board. Hopefully they had a great experience through our website and they're easing their way into the, our doors and we're still recruiting them because if you don't handle it right, they, they could have a bad taste in their mouth and not, not join the company. So you do kind of need to think about the post offer as still you're recruiting them to ease them into the assimilation process. So it's a phased approach. So we wanted the employees to know that we actually have these tools and we have built this process around them and now it's just more of an organized approach and letting them know this is what's going to happen and this is what to expect and, and watch out for these kind of conversations to have with your managers about your talent management. There are learning and development opportunities through our training website portal. Um, we're going to set you up for meet and greets, building an internal network to support you and set you up for success. Yes, we have manager and employee communication planning and we have tools and templates to help encourage and foster and get that going. Um, this is all about creating tools to help guide the discussions. We're not managing it, but we're setting it up as an option for them. And so that's the real difference from an HR perspective to set the manager up for success. We're not doing it for them. We're just giving them the tools and making it easier for them to hopefully have a successful relationship. And then um, we wanted them to really learn more about our Edwards culture. There's a lot of great stuff that goes on in our company that we talk about from a recruiting perspective that our managers might kind of take for granted or forget that, oh, this is a really big deal. This is how we you know, um, get this kind of information and here's who you need to talk to about X, Y, and Z and so forth. So getting them connected is also a big piece. So it's refreshing and educating the manager on what success looks like so that we can have strong retention numbers, and strong metrics at a later time. So this is a different screenshot for the employees. So we, again, we've categorized it. Um, so each category is, again, you know, this information was out there, and we just put this together as a hub. So each um, bullet, you see, is an actual link. And so we categorized it by, obviously, topic-related and um, uh, theme-based. And we wanted to have it more uh, visually uh, user-friendly versus heavy content. And so each line that you see is the link that takes them to 
like the IT website. And then there's going to be further details on the IT site on how to navigate to get access to your phone and so forth and getting set up for VPN when you're working from home. Now, campus navigation, you know, um, team contacts, campus maps, um, key contacts, expense and travel is a big deal. Getting your credit card set up in advance so that you're prepared to do some business travel because that takes time. So again, that's educating the employee and the manager. It could take a couple of weeks just to get a credit card, go through the application process, setting up your account with travel. A lot of this stuff, people don't realize it takes a long time and so they do it thinking that they can travel tomorrow and then they're stuck on a couple hours today working on you know, getting their account set up and then there's increased frustration. So again, it's just trying to be more proactive about what to expect and plan. So this is the site for the hiring managers. A uh, little different look and feel. Um, again, this is categorized, focused, and to what Adam was talking about, the pre-boarding. And so this, uh, the pre-boarding one to two weeks prior to start date, is we wanted to give some type of a time frame for them so that they're kind of aware and, and help plan them, plan for the employees. And a lot of the pre-boarding, uh, we created communication templates that actually go through our applicant tracking system, and we use Taleo. And so that has really streamlined our process and made things a lot more efficient and really taken off the, um, the expectation of the manager to do the pre-boarding because of the automated process that we've built in. And we work closely with the admins on what they can do to help set up the managers for success and the employees and also support the recruiting function or recruit, recruiting operations to um, send out um, the, the key information, getting their laptops organized and ordered, their business cards ordered, um, you know, maybe helping the manager set up the meetings so that they can meet with their meet and greets and their network, right? So it definitely takes a village and you really need to think about who all is involved with the onboarding process and get them connected to what your process is and share and visually express what that success looks like and plan the communication around that because it's, it is a tailored, uh, communicated approach, but the goal and the philosophy is the same. So there's just different uh, wheels that you're working with. Um, and then the post-boarding, you know, again, there, the individual bullets of welcome orientation, employee guidelines and procedures, those are additional links that take them to different pages with more information, more tools and uh, templates and guidelines. And, and it was also another way for HR to kind of help set the expectation with the hiring manager that this is what we expect from a company philosophy, a company approach. We want you to assimilate and set your employee up for success and try and minimize some of the performance management issues, right? And have higher retention because it's very expensive to hire and to lose employees, as to Adam's points earlier. And then the assimilation piece, we work closely with the HR business partners and they created the templates and what they feel is important for the managers to use to set up that relationship and um, set the expectations moving forward and setting up the, the objectives and the goals and to, that leads into their mid-year review or their annual review and setting the tone of what kind of training is available, what options do you have? And it's, it's setting those early discussions for career planning. And you know, it says a lot to the new employee that, wow, I just started, they're already investing into me, they're already spending time, and this feels great, and I'm having a great experience, hopefully. And you know, we also rely heavily on our employee referrals, so that ties into you know, your employee referral, which lowers the, the recruiting costs, which, you know, lowers a lot of other costs from a manager's budget perspective as well. So um, all of these things are pretty much tied together from a metric perspective to what Adam was talking about as well. So um, key results and next steps. So, I mean, this, this, was, this was a lot for us to accomplish and, and get done, and it was a huge huge success for us because the managers felt that they had better information, they knew what to do, they knew where to go, and they had tools already set up for them. So we just made it easier for them to take off you know, the responsibility of the logistics so that they can really focus on the relationship that they're trying to establish with their new hires and to make it more, you know, just, just more access for the employees. 
we really wanted to formalize the standardized process by creating the, the intranet site and setting that expectation from a company perspective that this is the way that we're going to be doing it now. We, we really left it up to the managers, and so there were a lot of inconsistencies with different business units and functions on who does what. And you know, as Edwards grew over the last few years, we realized we, we, can't, we can't act that way anymore. We really do need to take this as a company approach and really ensure the candidate experience and the new employee experience for branding purposes, retention purposes, and so forth. So um, we've been receiving a lot of positive feedback from the field sales organization just because what we call it noise. The noise has gone away. <laughs> we haven't had a lot of uh, we haven't had a lot of redundant questions, so that's kind of an indicator to us. Okay, we we're doing something right. You know, they they're not asking us the same redundant questions over and over again. They're they're not as noisy as they they were because they were you know legitimately frustrated. They were trying to get information, and it's good that they raised that to us. So really about the next step now is, is continuing the adoption and the utilization of the site because this is a change management process as well. I mean, um, you know, we in HR can say this is great, this is great, this is great. But the managers, it's a change of routine, it's a change of behavior. So it's really, you know, again, kind of educating the managers and validating what the value is to this and the benefits it, it's bringing to the table, impacting the hire manager, the new employee, and the company as a whole. So painting that bigger picture to them so that they can get on board and adopt has been pretty critical. So um, I think in the future we're going to try and create more um, refined key metrics. And we're getting a lot of feedback from our global partners as well. They're, they're hearing about it and they want to see what we're doing. And so they're coming to us asking, hey, you know, how, how did you do this? How did you get it started? What's key and what are your learnings that you went through this? so that they can establish something that's more tailored for their region and so forth. So those are definitely steps in the right direction and, and indicators that this was um, a high value for our organization. So that concludes our, our webinar. I think we've run out of time and, and probably don't have time to, uh, for Q&A. I, I think uh, uh, Higher Right and Heather has offered to take questions uh, through uh, her website, um, and uh, we'll try to answer some of those. Uh, but I want to thank everyone who's been on the call for their time today. Hopefully this was informative and helpful for you, and uh, we wish you the best in your onboarding practices. Thank you. Thank you.